In February of 2023, YouTuber John the Duncan uploaded a video titled Pride and Why I Felt Ashamed to Be There. John the Duncan is a YouTuber that I generally like, and the first half of the video is pretty good. He goes into his experience of going to London Pride for the first time as an open bisexual and seeing a live performance of Netta, a singer who won Eurovision for Israel in 2018. There he goes into how Israel uses progressive causes such as feminism and LGBT rights as a distraction and straight-up excuse for the atrocities it commits against the Palestinians, including queer Palestinians. This is a concept known as pinkwashing, and Israel has used Eurovision Song Contest as a tool to carry this out. I have covered this topic before in my Douze Paul review. John the Duncan's original video is linked in the description, and I would highly recommend watching it so you can get a bit more context before you watch this one. In the second part of the video, titled Pinkwashing, Eurovision, and White Supremacy, JD takes what he already established about Israel's pinkwashing and extends it to the Eurovision Song Contest, and thus Europe as a whole. He makes some interesting claims, and I'm going to go through them one by one. The first is that Eurovision allows any country to take part, regardless of geography, as long as they adhere to perceived European values. The story and power of Eurovision as a method of pinkwashing, exerting state soft power and projecting a shared Europeanness, is a well-examined one. And it's actually essential for understanding what Israel actually is, to understand how it's a project of European colonialism, which constantly seeks to align itself with a mythology of European values, a mythology which includes a supposed tolerance of LGBT people, which is a sick joke when we look at Britain's murderous transphobia. So let's talk about Eurovision and pink washing. Eurovision was established in 1956 with the explicit goal to create and broadcast a coherent common European identity. Since its creation, it's become a route through which states have not only laid claim to a European identity, which is not bound by geographical boundaries, and you know, it's not just Israel, but other settler colonial genocidal regimes like Australia, which have become included in Eurovision. Something that I've been seeing a lot of, especially in the aftermath of the shit show that occurred behind the scenes at Eurovision 2024, is people asking, why is Israel allowed to take part in Eurovision if they're not in Europe? And not many people seem to know the answer and fill in the gaps themselves, coming up with things like, it's because it's a white settler colonial state and thus an extension of Europe. But the reason why Israel can participate in Eurovision is actually pretty straightforward. In order to take part in Eurovision, a country must be a member of the European Broadcasting Union. To join the EBU, a country must fulfil at least one of two criteria. One, be a member of the Council of Europe, a human rights organisation. Or two, be within the European Broadcasting Area. This covers every country that falls fully or partially within the 40th Parallel East and 30th Parallel North. Not only does this include Israel, but it also includes a number of Arabic countries in North Africa and the Middle East. Several of these countries are also members of the EBU and could join Eurovision if they wanted to. The only Arabic country to have done so is Morocco, which participated once in 1980. Tunisia planned on debuting in 1977, but ended up pulling out, and Lebanon was supposed to take part in 2005 and even select a song, but they could not guarantee that they would broadcast Israel's entry as it was forbidden by Lebanese law, and this resulted in a late withdrawal. The chances of any Arab states joining Eurovision in the near future is slim, but it remains an option. The only Eurovision participant that is not a full member of the EBU is, of course, Australia. Australia was first invited to Eurovision as a guest in 2015, and became a permanent part of the contest in 2016. Claim 2. Eurovision presents its participating countries as the in-group, and Muslims as the out-group. And of course the other side of this tolerance is the creation of a demonised Muslim other, defined by its intolerance of gay people, of women as well, is, an, is another common one that this other is constructed against. It is built on excluding, othering, and destroying Muslims. So there are two Muslim countries that currently take part in Eurovision, Albania and Azerbaijan. Albania's population is around 51% Muslim, 16% Christian, and the remainder are non-religious or other. Albania is honestly a success story in terms of cultivating a common identity that defies religious lines, something that its neighbours to the north could certainly learn a thing or two from. Azerbaijan is more solidly Muslim, with 97% of the population affiliated with the religion. They are also one of Israel's biggest ass-kissers. 
In the past, Eurovision has had two other regulars that were Muslim plurality or majority. There's Bosnia Herzegovina, which debuted in 1993, withdrew in 2012, and since then has only participated once in 2016. This is mainly due to financial issues and outstanding debt to the EBU. And then there's Turkey, which has not participated in Eurovision since 2012. The reasons for this, I will get into later. Turkey and Azerbaijan have both won once each. In addition, Loreen has won for Sweden twice. She is of Moroccan Berber descent and was raised in a liberal Muslim family. And in 2016, Ukraine scored a victory with Jamala, a Muslim woman who is half Crimean Tatar. And I could go on about all the singers of Muslim heritage who took part in the contest, but an interesting case study is Bilal Hassani. Bilal is genderqueer and uses both he and she pronouns. She is of Moroccan descent and represented France in Eurovision 2019, when it was hosted in Israel. After winning the national selection, she faced harassment and death threats from people in France over her sexuality, appearance and ethnicity. And the Israeli broadcaster thought it would be cool and normal to make a mini-series about a gay Arab who represents France in a fictional song contest and gets extorted by ISIS to carry out a terrorist attack in Tel Aviv. It's not entirely clear if the protagonist was intentionally based on Bilal due to the production timeline, but it's an interesting glimpse into how Israel tries to pit LGBTQ people and Muslims against each other, and I reviewed the series in a previous video, link in the description. The French delegation and the EBU were not happy about the series, and in response the creators were like, why are you offended by this series? We're not making fun of Eurovision or France, we're just making fun of the Middle East. Viewing the series as a threat to Bilal's safety, the EBU sent a letter to Cannes, the Israeli broadcaster, warning them about the serious ramifications that the series could cause, and Khan agreed not to air it until Eurovision was over. Haaretz, a so-called left-wing Israeli publication, wrote several articles about Bilal and the Duzapont series, and tried to play up this idea that Bilal was receiving mass backlash from fundamentalist Muslims, which is very dishonest. Not saying this didn't happen at all, but Haaretz provided no receipts, and clearly the resentment expressed by people within Bilal's home country was of little concern to them. And in doing so, Israel constructs itself as consistent with the European mythology of supporting sexual liberation. And Israel is an in-group with European identity, while Palestine is an out-group. There's a pretty simple reason Palestine can't take part in Eurovision. It's not a member of the UN. The same can be said for Kosovo, a country that declared independence from Serbia in 2008 and is 89% Muslim. Kosovo is backed by the USA and most, but not all, members of the European Union and NATO. Are you going to tell me that there's no desire to make Kosovo part of the in-group? This hypothesis that Eurovision is including Israel while excluding yucky Muslim countries doesn't hold much water. But there is something to be said about how Eurovision has accepted Australia with open arms, but has been a lot more reluctant to welcome Kazakhstan, a country that is partially in Europe. Kazakhstan first broadcast Eurovision in 2013, and has been trying to join the EBU as a full member since 2008. Kazakhstan has a solidly Muslim population, and pretty good relations with Israel, so that's not part of the issue. The most plausible reason I can give is this. Many, many non-EBU members have aired the contest over the years, but none have shown anywhere as much consistent interest in the contest as Australia. By the time they debuted in 2015, the contest had been broadcast for over 30 years since 1983, constantly reporting high viewing figures despite kicking off as late as 5 in the morning. Kazakhstan is eligible for Junior Eurovision, which has a different selection committee to the main contest, and took part from 2018 until 2022. In the same year, the Kazakh broadcaster decided to stop broadcasting Eurovision. The viewing figures were slipping, and it was pretty clear that Kazakhs were getting tired of watching when they couldn't send their own entries. But who knows how things would be if we were in an alternate universe where, I don't know, El Salvador aired Eurovision for 30 years straight and developed a strong fan base. Claim 3, Eurovision reinforces white supremacy. My clickbaity title and thumbnail will pay off. Don't worry. Eurovision as an event has contributed to not only creating a particular dimension of European identity, but it has also served as the route through which states have performed this identity. This European identity is far from innocent. It is innately tied to capitalism, to white supremacy, and to violent border regimes. The, uh, the pink washing of Eurovision and Israel's participation in it promotes the Islamophobia which gets projected all the way through Europe and, importantly, through queer spaces like London Pride too. It reinforces white supremacy. If anything, 
Eurovision has been used as a tool for whitewashing issues related to race and ethnicity for way longer than it's been used for pinkwashing. In 1960, Norway debuted in Eurovision with Voi Voi, performed by Nora Brokstedt, a white Norwegian woman, with lyrics about hearing a Sami girl sing and appreciating the music of their people. By 1960, Norway was barely rolling back on centuries of forced assimilation policies. Legislation that banned the Sami languages in the classroom was repealed only a year prior. In 1967, Portugal sent the first black man to Eurovision, Eduardo Nascimento. This was while Portugal was still a fascist, I mean, corporatist dictatorship. In 1971, the UK sent Claude Rogers, a Catholic from Northern Ireland, right in the middle of a particularly violent period of the Troubles. In 2017 and 2019, Hungary sent Yossi Papai, a singer of Romani descent, and his first entry even featured lyrics in the Romani language. I would say the Roma are treated as second-class citizens in Hungary and neighbouring countries, but a separate species would be more accurate. Several former Eastern Bloc countries with negligible black populations have sent performers of at least partial African descent. This includes Czechia, Hungary, Latvia, Belarus, Bulgaria, Ukraine twice, and Estonia twice, including the first and only black winner of the contest, Dave Benton. When asked, the majority of people in these countries said they were not comfortable with their children dating someone black. The two countries at the centre of this in-group, out-group hypothesis are notorious for using Eurovision for this purpose. Australia's first four participants were all people of colour. In 1999, Israel sent the group Aiden, which included brothers Eddie and Gabriel Butler, the sons of Chicago black Israelites. The black Hebrew Israelites are a movement that believes African Americans are descended from ancient Israelites, and under Israeli law, they are not recognized as having the right of return. In 2021, Israel sent Aiden and Elena, a Jew of Ethiopian descent. Ethiopian Jews were not granted the right of return until the 1970s, and Israel has a long track record of giving Ethiopian Jewish women birth control injections through coercion or false pretenses. <laughs> and in 2009, in the aftermath of the Gaza massacre, Israel sent the entry, There Must Be Another Way, a Jewish promoting unity between Jews and Arabs. It is the only Israeli entry to feature lyrics in Arabic, sung by Mira Awad, this pale-ass, half-Bulgarian Arab Christian. Is this the best you could do, Israel? You couldn't get someone who actually grew up in Gaza or West Bank and experienced your barbarism firsthand. You couldn't even get one of the almost 2 million Muslim Arab Israeli citizens that you're always virtue signaling about. Or alternatively, is this Israel telling the world who they deem an acceptable Arab? I want to make it clear that I have no hate towards Mira Awad. Kudos to her for trying. She did an interview back in December 2023, and though she does try to both sides the conflict, She's not afraid to call out Israel's abysmal treatment of Gazans over the years, and said that she would not represent Israel today. There's nothing inherently wrong with all this representation, in fact it's inherently good, but it shouldn't be seen as an excuse to dismiss any real wider issues. And that's the true danger of virtue signalling. It's pretty clear that JD doesn't actually know that much about Eurovision beyond how it's perceived in popular culture. And he supplements this with a single source that he cites as Fernandez del Campo, 2021. Eurovision as an event has contributed to not only creating a particular dimension of European identity, but it has also served as the route through which states have performed this identity. The legitimization of European belonging that the contest allows has for long been utilised to associate states with European values, regardless of geography or little else apart from European identification. I've already explained how this isn't really true. Through an association of Europe with a particular branch of modernity, Eurovision has represented European belonging since its conception and participation in the contest is more hard fought for than ever. This is objectively false. In 2021, there were best three countries fighting to participate in Eurovision in any capacity. Kazakhstan, Kosovo, and Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein's only national broadcaster, 1FL TV, has been trying to join Eurovision since 2009. But lack of funding and disinterest in their government has left this ambition on hold. The period in which Eurovision participation was most hard fought for was the early 1990s in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism. 
The EBU didn't really have a plan for including all these new countries, and they were kept on hold from participating in Eurovision until 1993. I tracked down the citation, and it's titled New Power Unlocked, Israel as a Case Study for Eurovision as a Europeanization Tool. This study is, to put it lightly, utter shite. It is full of factual errors. It says that Netta was Israel's second victor, she was the fourth. It says that the orchestra was abolished in 1977, it was in 1999. It says that Ukraine's winning entry in 2016 alluded to the 2014 annexation of Crimea by Russia. While this was certainly a motivation for sending the entry, it actually alluded to the forced deportation of Crimean Tatars from the peninsula in 1944, hence the song title. It says that Eurovision organizers banned Israel from hosting the contest in Jerusalem in 2019. This is complete rubbish. The executive supervisor, Yon Olesan, traveled to Jerusalem to check out venues in the area. It says that Jordan altered the broadcast of Eurovision 2018 to hide Israel's victory. This actually refers to an incident that happened in 1978, the first time Israel won. Jordan didn't broadcast Eurovision 2018 at all, and Netta's victory has been acknowledged in Jordanian publications. It says that Turkey pulled out of Eurovision in 2013 because Finland's 2012 entry featured an onstage kiss between two male performers. It was actually Finland's 2013 entry that featured a same-sex kiss, after Turkey had already withdrawn, and it was between two women, not two men. Turkey actually withdrew from Eurovision due to the jury's return to the contest and making up 50% of the vote, which curbed Turkey's ability to collect points from diaspora year after year. It is true that Turkey did not take well to Finland's 2013 entry, and pulled out a broadcast in the contest in 2013 at the last minute. And the study correctly states that Conchita vs victory in 2014 was cited by Turkey as a reason they refused to return to the contest. The study also misreads its own citations. It says, There have been years when the only broadcast part of the show was the voting, and the number of viewers did not drop significantly. This refers to 2009, when Austria, which wasn't participating, only aired the voting live and then aired the rest of the contest afterward says that expulsion from the EBU is a regular happening. The citation was referring to an incident where Romania was kicked out of Eurovision 2016 after the deadline due to outstanding debts to the EBU, but it was not banned from the organization and returned to Eurovision the following year. At the time of the study, only Belarus had been suspended from the EBU due to submitting entries that violated the rules and not responding by the deadline. The only other country to have been banned from the contest at that point was the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia due to UN-imposed sanctions. Yugoslavia left the EBU in 1992 after its member broadcaster ceased to exist. And it generally just makes a lot of poor observations about the contest. It says that Russia made an empty threat to boycott following the victory of Shamala. This is true, but they don't mention that Russia ended up withdrawing anyway because their selected participant was banned from Ukraine for illegally crossing into Crimea. It says that Moniskin's victory for Italy in 2021 marked a historical win for the rock genre in Eurovision, but makes no mention of Lordi, who won for Finland with a hard rock song 15 years earlier, and arguably had a much greater impact on the songs of subsequent editions. It mentions how in 2007, the top 15 spots of the final were occupied by Eastern European countries. This is sort of true, though if you call someone from Hungary or Slovenia Eastern European, I hope you won't miss your teeth. The whole concept of Eastern Europe is a controversial one, because it doesn't have much to do with geography and is rooted in Cold War politics and othering. How many times have British or Irish people complained that well, we can't do well in Eurovision because there's too many Eastern European countries? The study also says that Eastern Europe is the largest of Eurovision's four voting blocs, lumping together countries with absolutely nothing in common like Macedonia, Hungary and Georgia. What are the other three voting blocs it's referring to? Doesn't provide a citation. I guess the Nordics are another. That one's a classic. UK and Ireland? No idea. And towards the end of the study, there's this bizarre line that reads, European alignment with Western liberal values feels shallow once one remembers that Turkey opted out of the contest, not because their treatment of the LGBT community was misaligned with such values, but because they chose not to align themselves to the contest that did just that. It looks like they're trying to paint Turkey as some poor Muslim country who got sidelined from Eurovision because they wouldn't stop pushing the gay agenda and, like... Go fuck yourself. Not only is this not the reason why Turkey initially left the contest, but Hungary left for very similar reasons in 2020, and somehow I don't think the author of the study would be giving them the same sympathy. Most of the hostility towards Eurovision's place as a big gay event, as JD calls it, comes from people in participating countries. I've already talked about Bilal Asani, but it was a similar situation for Don International, 
a transgender woman who won for Israel in 1998. Israel simps love to bring her up, but it wasn't Palestinians who sent her death threats and protest in the streets against her participation. It was Orthodox Jews in Israel. Do Orthodox Jews deserve to be bombed and displaced? And Conchita Verst is a whole can of worms. From the day she was internally selected in September 2013, there were Facebook groups saying nasty things about her persona and urging the Austrian broadcaster to change their mind. In the lead up to Eurovision 2014, there were petitions in Ukraine, Belarus and Russia urging for their countries to pull out the contest due to Conchita's participation. I can remember very well the uproar following her victory because my 13 year old self wasted his whole summer on the internet trying to fight against it. People were convinced that it was the end of Western civilization and whining about how Eurovision was all about politics now. LGBT plus rights wouldn't even be a political issue if so many dickheads weren't against them. People were fear mongering over who was going to win Eurovision next. I remember seeing one comment that was like, next year's winner is going to have a dick growing out of his head. And of course, the next winner ended up being the most harmless mainstream pop song. If Eurovision is intended to be a tool of pinkwashing, it's pretty bad at it. Eurovision has done much more to expose the divisions between Europeans than it has to be some force uniting the West against the yucky brown people. What has Eurovision done to alleviate beef between, say, Serbia and Albania, or Greece and the one and only Macedonia? There's a whole Wikipedia page about all the times Armenia and Azerbaijan have pissed each other off at Eurovision. The rest of JD's video is about how queer Muslims often feel excluded in LGBTQ spaces or forced to assimilate. That part is fine. To summarise, JD tackled a subject that he really wasn't equipped to talk about and used a crappy study to back up his points. It's not something I hold against him, but it's still worth calling out. His video was uploaded a few months before the outbreak of the Israel-Brown Children War, and it's been kind of beautiful seeing how Eurovision 2024 crumbled Israel's pinkwashing facade. The Israeli commentators show their disdain for any LGBTQ person who dared say anything they didn't like. They encouraged viewers to swear at and insult Bambi Thug. They called Nemo one of the sons and daughters of Amalek, i.e. an enemy of the Jewish people. And they called Ali Alexander a Hamas supporter and an anti-Semite. What did the EBU do about it? Nothing! 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 And the white Twitter gaze still eat up Israel's bullshit, no matter the expense. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and no beheaded babies in 2025.